cool. So welcome to the very last talk of TQC in session B. So we will hear from Di Fang about um, uniform throttle observable error bounds in the semi-classical regime. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for people staying for my talk. I really appreciate the opportunity to present here. However, I want to express my sincere apology for not being able to make it in person. I'm currently in a visa transition period. Essentially means if I travel outside of the US, I will not be able to return. So anyhow, let's get started. Uh, so my talk uh, today, this is a, a long title with a, uh, essentially a number of keywords. Uh, uh, the, the topic or the question I'm going to consider is this so-called semi-classical Schrodinger equation, which is a multi-scale Schrodinger equation. And the result I'm going to prove is regarding trotterization and its corresponding observable errors. This is a joint work with Yuna Bonswell at Berkeley. So uh, the outline of my talk is the following. I will first discuss what is the problem, this semi-classical Schrodinger equation, which is a multi-scale problem. And then I will discuss about the state of art for this simulation um, problem. And then I will state where our contribution sits in. And finally, I will give some uh, proof ideas together with intuitions. All right, uh, so I would like to start with uh, some motivation for considering multi-scale problem. I would like to say that multi-scale problem are actually everywhere in nature and it's uh, actually a widely studied uh, subject in um, uh, various disciplines. You can consider, for example, plasma or some fluid sits in between the kinetic level and fluid level, or you can think about, say, molecular dynamics sits in between the quantum mechanics and the classical ordinary differential equations. Um, or you can just imagine maybe you have certain material, there are some larger structures going on together with some finer structure, which becomes a multi-scale. So in these multi-scale problems, typically one can uh, identify a small parameter that represents this scale separation. Since it's a quantum day, so I'm going to discuss one example in the quantum world. So let's imagine if we take uh, think about the nuclei dynamics. We can easily write down the Hamiltonian. Well, this uh, uh, is going to be a multi-dimensional problem because uh, we can have multiple particles in the nuclei. Each of the nuclei is in a very dimensional uh, space. We will have a, a momentum part together with a potential part. So the momentum part will be divided by this mass, which is a mass of the nucleus. It's going to be something that is very large compared to, say, the mass of the electron. Correspondingly, you can use the largeness of this uh, mass to identify a small parameter. So this will, uh, we are going to call this parameter small h for uh, the this talk. This h, the reason we call this h is because it's sort of a rescale Planck constant. If you think about this formulation, it's really agrees with our uh, regular uh, quantization of the momentum operator, it's give you negative i h. Uh, derivative. This is precisely alignment, just that now h is a small parameter, we do not assume it to be one a priori. Well, you can consider the time evolution, which is a Schrodinger equation, where well, the time I denote as t tilde. Uh, it's uh, though the right hand side is unbounded, so these differential operators are unbounded operator. Nevertheless, it actually is not difficult to imagine because the h are so small, if you just evolve it for a very short time, for a constant number of time, there's nothing too much interesting is going to go uh, to happen in this differential equation. So it's of interest for us to consider much longer time. You can do so by rescale the time scale by divided by an h. And then we will uh, come with our familiar Schrodinger equations. And the point here is really that the new time scaling that we are considering, if we consider of order one time, it actually corresponding to a super long time for the original problem. So you can sort of view this h inverse as the time scaling for the original problem. All right. So uh, if we put everything together, this is the Schrodinger equation that is in the same classical regime, which means that this rescale Planck constant, say maybe it's the mass ratio between the electron and nuclei, it's something that is very small. Uh, I would like to mention these uh, equations appears in various different uh, contexts and the multi-scale parameter is also have various different uh, meanings in different contexts, such as molecular dynamics and nuclear Wood's dynamics, uh, Aaron Fass and so on and so forth, you can see these reviews together with some textbooks describing the applications for these, uh, this problem. 
But for us today, what we really want to do is to simulate this, uh, this problem. You immediately realize this is really just a Hamiltonian simulation problem where there are various ways to do so. What I want to point it out is that this multi-scale problem is sort of special in the sense that it involves unbounded operators, these differential operators. Second, it involves a multi-scale. So our real question here is really that how does our cost scale with this multi-scale parameter h? Before I uh, discuss about uh, uh, the possible scalings, and uh, let me just show you a short movie of how the solution will behave like in terms of this equation. So the x-axis is going to be uh, the, the, the x, uh, the spatial degrees of freedom. What you are seeing is the solution involving in time. For example, if I take an almost Gaussian wave package like initial uh, condition, you will see that the solution quickly do not look Gaussian uh, anymore. It will be have some stretching, some propagation. Uh, this is one example. Let me give you another example where there is a wave, uh, wave sitting here. As time evolving, you will see there will be some spreading and there's a, a oscillatory behaviors going on. So the point is that this is a differential operator with unbounded operator. We will never directly simulate unbounded operator on an actual uh, as an actual algorithm. We always need to discretize it spatially. The question is how do you uh, pace these grades or how many bases do you need for the spatial discretization? This is because all of this solution, if you identify, it turns out the spatial oscillation sits on the scale of H, which means that you need to pace the spatial grades that small, uh, that's um, that close to each other in order to resolve these oscillations. So what I'm saying is that the spatial mass uh, is uh, of order H, and you can actually uh, sh uh, show that this is a uh, uh, this is actually uh, uh, necessary for you to get an uh, actual solution. I will not go that far. But the point is that after choosing the spatial discretization, you will be able to fix the uh, dimension of this problem. It will also turn this continuous problem into a discrete problem, which is uh, ready to, for us to do Hamiltonian simulation. And the size of the matrix is fixed uh, the, as well as the size of the Hilbert space. All right. Um, so. Um, now that uh, we are ready to discuss about the cost, so the, for the rest of the talk, I will be focusing on simulating this uh, discrete problem with a spatial discretization uh, uh, performed uh, on this uh, spatial dimensions. So uh, it's not hard to imagine if you, you think about to approximate the solution, the cost actually scales recipro uh, with respect to the inverse of H. Uh, why is that? Let's imagine if H decreases, the operator norm of the Hamiltonian actually increases. So this will tell you that you will need more cost or more um, uh, complexity to, uh, to capture the correct behavior. So actually, if you think about the Nasty commutators, if you uh, want to see whether Trotter can improve the bounds further, it turns out all the Nasty commutator also sits on this H inverse scale. So what does it say in terms of error estimate? Here is just one example for first order Trotter. L is the number of Trotter steps. What you will see is that the error in the solution on the right-hand side, you will have H inverse dependence, which tells you as H decreases, the cost of the number of Trotter steps need to be increasing. So uh, you may wonder whether this uh, estimate is sharp, maybe it's too loose, that's why you have an H inverse. You can actually find an instance that you reach this H inverse upper bound. So this is what you have to do if you want to simulate the, the right solutions. All right. Um, however, as a theorist, whenever we see a bound, we always ask ourselves, is there any possibility to um, improve it, to do better? It turns out there's this, I would say, like remarkable, like really interesting numerical observations together with asymptotic arguments, which stating that if you look at certain observable expectations instead of the solution themselves, the cost turns out to be uh, numerical evidence shows that the cost is not that sensitive to H inverse. Uh, on high level, uh, why is that even possible? Well, you can think about these observable expectations are sandwiched. The observables are really taking some ex, uh, some integrals with respect to the spatial dimension. So when you have these integrals, many of this oscillation behavior will cancel each other out due to this uh, destructive interference. So there is chance you will get a much smaller error compared to uh, just considering the wave functions. So. These numerical evidence uh, together with some uh, asymptotic argument actually exists in literature since 2002. There are actually two reviews on Arctica Numerica to, uh, 
uh, specifically dedicated to this problem. And there are existing analysis for this problem, but they only work for the spatial continuous cases. What I want to emphasize is that since you know, an actual algorithm, the spatial degrees of freedom are all discrete. We are not simulating differential, operate, uh, differential operators on an uh, actual computer. So it's very important to take into account the spatial discrete um, spatial discretizations in this problem. So um, the open question here is really that can we provide a rigorous justification by providing a uniform in H, which means the error bound is independent of H, completely independent of H, and this cope with the spatial discretization. This is really the open problem in the literature. And uh, uh, that is what we are going to answer. So here is our result. What we are going to look at is this error metric, uh, so-called observable error bounds, defined as the time evolved the observables, so observable in the Heisenberg uh, picture, and uh, the errors in between. And we were uh, so um, this is uh, actually a weaker norm compared to the worst case scenarios, the uh, the unit uh, the operator uh, norm of the unit race because. Here we are not taking arbitrary initial condition, uh, arbitrary observables. We are looking at this uh, simple class of observables, which are essentially smooth observables on the interval that you are considering, and it works for arbitrary initial condition. Initial condition you do not need to take a special, and it works with spatial discretization. This is what we have. The point, the essential, the uh, the point, the um. The key point is really that if you look at the right hand side, it's independent of H inverse completely. So this will imply that to simulate these discrete problems, the number of shorter steps you need to take is actually in H independent if you just want to capture the observable behaviors instead of the solution. Well, uh, on a multi-scale level, this also means that if you just look at some, uh, you are interested in some observable quantities, then you may not need to resolve, fully resolve the fine structures in the problem. It will become possible. Um, so um, if we look at, uh, put it in uh, the, for this problem using different, various different methods, you will see that if you measure the operator norm of the unit tree, which is a worst case scenario, the typical metric where people use, you will see that you have H inverse dependence of all of the existing algorithm. Uh, in many cases, if we look at totalization, if we take initial condition to be something that is special, say it's uh, for unbounded operator, typically if you have good regularities, then you can vastly improve your cost in terms of the parameter. However, it turns out to be not the case for this particular problem, which is also interesting point to note. Uh, um, however, if we look at these observable, time evolved observable, it turns out uh, what we can get is a, a cost, a, a number of charter steps completely independent of this H inverse. All right. So now I'm going to sort of discuss the proving ideas together with some high level intuitions. I will not go into too much into the mathematical details. So first of all, I want to just give you a taste, which is not the proof that we are going to use, but uh, this is uh, actually a very conventional way for people to look at multi-scale problems. Uh, this hopefully sort of gave you an idea why this is uh, maybe uh, H independent or weak dependence on H bound is reasonable. So uh, what we have is this differential equation, this continuous Schrodinger equation. And correspondingly, we have a numerical scheme. In our case, it's going to be a totalization. The question is, we want to estimate the error in between within some error metric. In a multi-scale problem, what typically people will do is that, OK, I have this small, uh, this parameter h. Though it's finite, it's small. But uh, let's try to send it into uh, goes to 0 and see whether there is a limiting equation. If there is a limiting equation, I'm going to use the limiting equation as a stepping stone to a triangle inequality in my estimate. What do I mean? I mean that let's try to send h goes to 0 and see whether there is a well-defined limiting uh, structures to it. In this case, it's for the continuous differential equation, there is indeed a, a, a well-defined limiting structures. The point is that these errors will vanish as h goes to zero. So this is a symptotic argument. And correspondingly, if this is a case, you correspondingly see whether there is something similar behaviors happens for your numerical scheme. Say, if I have shorter, if uh, there is also a limit, then this point of error will also vanish as h goes to zero. And then if you look at the, the two limiting equations, since h is already sent to 0, there's no h going on. So this part, the difference in between these are actually independent of h. 
So I would want to emphasize this works if everything, uh, all of the spatial discretization remain undiscretized. So there's no spatial discretization going on. If you look at the continuous uh, differential equations, you will be able to complete this paradigm. And then the corresponding errors, you just use a triangle inequality, you will have a positive power in alpha together with some uh, some errors that is common here. So these um, continuous space analysis has uh, already appears in the literature and uh, where this alpha, you can keep improving it uh, for, uh, for, for different instances. So you can, uh, you can see that um, there, are, there are two things I want to mention. First of all, this paradigm does not really work for spatial discretized cases because it turns out that in this uh, limiting behavior, the spatial discretization converge in a very weak sense, in a weak start topology, which is not sufficient to, uh, to support a uniform estimate. Even if there's any way to do so, well, the limiting uh, equations are not well uh, clearly defined, but even if you were able to do so, the best you can get is an additive bound instead of independent of H instead of uniform bound. Let me just quickly illustrate why this is sort of unnatural. Let's imagine if the number of total step L is taken to infinity. We know that total will converge to the actual problem that we start with. There should be no error at all. However, if you look at the additive error bounds, it tells you there's still some finite error due to the smallness of H, which is completely unnatural, especially if you take H is equal to one, then this is uh, something that is very weird, very odd. So a uniform error bound will not only uh, 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 work with uh, taking into account the spatial discretization, but also take care of this uh, very odd sort of uh, H dependency in the bound. So uh, now here is what we were able to do. What we do is instead of taking this conventional approach using the limiting equation as a stepping stone, we will forget about there is a limiting equation. We will directly look at the error representation between these two quantities. And uh, uh, it's uh, actually easy to write out a exact error representation, represent the time involved observable error bounds. I would say this is easy because there are very different ways to do so. There's this variational constant of formulation, a uh, formula way which is a lot more like a textbook way. There's more sophisticated way uh, proposed in this, uh, this paper. The key uh, difficulty or challenge we need to handle in our problem is this unboundedness of the operator and which is then translated into the discretization. So with spatial discretization, what do we do? So the key observation here in our uh, work is really that it turns out this discretized operators, we can identify them as a pseudo differential operator on a quantized torus. So this will allow us to use the continuous tools to work for this discrete problem. You just prove some continuous bound it will automatically give you the discrete bound as you like. This is a key observation. Um, but without going in much detail, let me just sort of using some example to illustrate what do I even mean? Like, okay, discrete bound, uh, uh, continuous bound. So here I'm just going to give you sort of uh, pseudo differential calculus uh, uh, 101. And hopefully um, uh, uh, what I'm saying this discrete bound and continuous bound uh, makes sense. So I'm going to start with a phase space function. Say it's a function, it has position in it, momentum in it. And then what we can do, excuse me, is we can do a quantization. This is actually a pseudo differential operator. So pseudo uh, quantization by itself is a, a, a pseudo differential operator. What this, uh, uh, this rule means is really uh, agree with the physical quantization, which means if I have position, I have a multiplication. If I have a momentum, then I will have a differential operator. What I want to emphasize is really that these continuous level operators are the easiest thing to work with, actually. Why? Because if you think about to estimating, say, the commutator, we immediately know it's IH. It's as that's that simple. You may wonder what about general operators? Well, that is not necessary position or momentum. It turns out by some uh, a continuous uh, um, uh, pseudo differential calculus, what you will uh, be able to prove is that for these uh, uh, general operators, you will also have uh, H gaining and there will be some remainder term, but the, but the take home message is really that in this procedure, you will be able to gain an uh, actual order of H. This is essentially plays a crucial role, how in the end of the day, we will be able to cancel out the H inverse on the right-hand side. So this is sort of a uh, nice uh, notice. But again, so far, everything was continuous. There's no discretization. 
So this is not what we want. This is not what we want to work with. So how do you cope with discretization? So it turns out if you have a, a matrix, here is an example of uh, uh, the quantization of the Laplacian, the second derivative operator, the momentum operator. It turns out if you have this matrix, you can identify them as a discrete pseudo differential operator or discrete quantization of a function of this form. And then um, we know that the operators are easier to estimate. It would be super nice if there's some connections between the operator bounds together with the matrices bounds. And then we only need to focus on these easier objects operators. We will get the discrete matrix bounds as what we like. And this is indeed possible, which is governed by the following theorem, which essentially states that if A is a smooth function on a torus, and then this translates into the discrete matrix, the spectral norm of the discrete matrix is actually upper bounded by the operator norm in the continuous level of the corresponding operators. So this allows us to use this easier operator bounds to estimate the discrete problem that we, uh, we, we would like to work with. So finally, just to show you, um, uh, this is uh, like uh, uh, what I just described. Finally, just to show you some numerical evidence, these were measured in the worst case scenario for charter one and charter two. And these were for the observable uh, error bounds, which are time evolved the observables. You can see the observable bounds are independent of H. However, the, uh, the worst case scenario as H decreases, the error actually increases. So um, now I'm ready to summarize. So we proved the first uh, uniform observable bound with, uh, with spatial discretization. The uh, take home message is really that um, in a multi-scale problem, if you just want to capture some observable information, maybe you don't need to fully resolve the very fine scale. And in doing so, what we need is to take uh, uh, this uh, weaker norm metric, which is observable errors instead of the worst case scenario operator errors. There are a number of open questions one can ask, say, can you cope for arbitrary uh, molecular dynamics with full electronuclear dynamics uh, uh, coupled together, non adiabatic dynamics, and so on? The second is that for other simulation problems involving multi-scale, is something similar going on? Is there an H-independent norm utilizing this direct estimate uh, error representation uh, uh, proving strategy that we described? And finally, uh, uh, is there any other application? Say, if I have a matrix I showed you, we can identify this matrix easily with a, a quantization, with a continuous object. Is this uh, uh, this discrete uh, uh, pseudo differential calculus tools useful for our context elsewhere? So, with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and uh, this is uh, all for my talk. Cool. Thank you very much, Yifan, for this talk. Thank um, you. So again, so the. The Discord server, um, where people can ask questions, is at the moment not very active. But the organizer told me that it will stay online, the server, for the next couple of hours or maybe even days. So if you have time, maybe you, you, you want to check it in, in a few yeah. minutes or hours again, because maybe some some participants have a question, in, in, not right now, but maybe in a couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah, sure, Fine sure, enough. sure. I will so, um, then I can I can ask a, a quick question. I'm not a full expert in this thing, but if I understood um, your result, which is nice, as far as I can tell correctly, then you have two difficulties, right? You have this unbounded continuous operator. So it's the one difficulty to prove this um, independence of H bar, you need yeah. to, to discretize it in a clever way, which you explained. And then second, Difficulty once you have a discrete problem, you also need to have a small trotterization that you get good error bounds, right? Which allows you then to prove this this, oh, this uniform. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. So uh we can we, the numerical scheme, there are various different uh, algorithms we can choose. It turns out uh trotter is the unique one that you can prove this independent of uh, uh independent uh -huh. of improved error bounds. So uh the uh, uh well, uh, it's not like for other uh, algorithm you can. You, there's absolutely no hope to get a better error estimate. But the point is that for other quantum algorithm, even if you get a better error estimate, it may not give you a better complexity in the query complexity. Okay. The reason is okay. because, for example, if we think about interaction picture Hamiltonian or maybe QSVT, they all involve some sort of block encoding, which involve the subnormalization mm -hmm. uh, operate uh, subnormalization factor, which is uh, uh, which is guaranteed to be something that is larger than the operator norm. I showed you the operator norm is a uh, is a 
uh, H inverse. So once you have, once you use any remote sort of uh, uh, block encoding, you cannot get rid of this H inverse. That's why Total is very powerful. You get a better estimates, you will get a better cost. Yeah. Okay. Okay, got it. Thank you very so, okay, much for the so, so, yeah. so, okay, just the only comment I have I, I'm not an infinite dimensional person, yeah, yeah, but I know yeah. that, that right people that, that work more with, with, with the noisy quantum computers, right? They, they have part of your problem they have is maybe related, right? They, have, they also want to do chorterization, but then they, are, they cannot do big circuits. So they want to have like not too many chorter steps. And people there, I think you cited some of them, like Andrew Childs and Nathan yeah, Lieber right. and many others. They developed in Sergei Bravi, they developed in the last couple of years very fancy variants of trotterization, for example, multi product trotter formulas. Yeah, that's right. That's there's right. a trade off, right? But okay, I just want to mention maybe since there's now a growing variety of trotter like algorithms, maybe some of them could be also useful for, 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 for your things. But okay, you, you know this, so maybe I, I stop. Yeah, here. yeah, right, 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 right. Um, I completely agree. Say multi uh, trotterization and also like randomize the uh, product yes. formulas would be, say, the natural uh, next step for us to look at whether okay. there's uh, uniform structures. Cool. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's very nice. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, this is the, the last talk. And so here we conclude the session. And again, you can ask questions on the Discord server in the next couple of hours. And with this, thanks again and have a good evening or day. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye, David.